Well, good morning, church family. How are you doing? Welcome to Christ for the Nations Online. I know it's another week. Can you believe it? Here we are, still meeting with one another virtually. I hope, though, and I pray that those have not been your only relationships or virtual, that you have been slowly but surely meeting with others. You know, today we have, I, I think, a pretty grave subject uh, ahead of us. Jesus is preaching his Sermon on the Mount, obviously, as we have been going through the book of Matthew. And Jesus is not afraid at all to tackle some of the tough issues. And so today, uh, this provocative, I call it a provocative issue on the Sermon on the Mount, is undeniable. Uh, if there was ever a time to avoid the sermon, it would be now. Though it was preached over 2,000 years ago, I want you to know this sermon is just as applicable today. And today's passage is no different than any others in the sense that Jesus is calling us into this upside down type of living. Jesus is calling his disciples to more than an outward conformity to the transformation that takes place on the inside. So this morning, I want to talk about the trap of lust. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, it starts like this. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. <laughs> There's a sense I want to go, amen, let's go. Talk to you next week. This is an incredible passage. There's a lot I want to say. And for those of you who are not a part of Christ for the Nations family, I do want to say welcome. I'm glad you're listening in. I want you to stay with me as we tackle this tough passage. Let's pray together. Again, Father, another week as we jump into your word. And as always, you're not afraid to bring up the obvious that many times we try to hide. And so as your word is brought forth today, may it be done with power, conviction, compassion, and by the strength of your spirit. Though I'm not with anyone physically right now, I pray that the spirit of God would begin to work in ways that we can only attribute to you. Convict us where we need convicting. Build us up where we need building up. But more than that, be glorified that we would display this kind of character as people of God so that those who are around us would say, wow, please share with me the reason for the hope that you have. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. When we talk about this subject of lust, it, it used to be, I, I think, as I was coming along, that pastors, uh, when it came to the subject of lust, would really start to address men only. There is certainly a difference between the way men and women experience lust and how it shows up in their lives. But the fact is, lust is a problem for men and women. So ladies, this is not a time out for you. This is not a time for you to snooze or to check out. I believe this issue of the heart applies to all of us. 
Jesus is not afraid, once again, to begin to tackle the issues that the Pharisees were afraid to bring up, or at least they co they covered it up, they masked it through all of their hypocrisy. And so Jesus, just like he did last week when I was preaching, he talks about the outward action. Last week, the outward action was murder. This week, the outward action is adultery. And so he says, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. In a technical sense, committing adultery is sexual intercourse between a man and a woman when both of them are married. That's kind of our technical American definition, or at least it used to be. In both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the word relates to sexual intercourse with anyone other than your spouse. And so that's kind of the broad definition. It is adultery is sexual intercourse with anyone other than your spouse. We will see that Jesus is broadening this as he enlightens his disciples. Now, Jesus was quoting from Exodus chapter 20, verse 1, you shall not commit adultery. We know this in Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall be surely put to death. Deuteronomy 5, verse 18, and you shall not commit adultery. Deuteronomy 22, verse 22, if a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both, both of them shall die. The man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge evil from Israel. This was a serious offense, church, and it was seen such as among God's people. But again, the Pharisees saw themselves as guiltless and in many ways, uh, because they had not committed adultery in their prideful sense like others, we see Jesus getting to the heart and challenging this issue of lusts. So Jesus takes this outward action and he begins to show them this inward reality. And he says this in verse 28, but I say to you, now I know what you traditionally have thought about this, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman, so he's broadening it to everyone, to everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus moves from the outward adherence of the law to the intended matter of the heart. Everyone who looks. And this word, when it says everyone who looks, it is a present participle. So it's the idea of everyone who keeps on looking. It's not that first glance but it's that look that keeps going on. It's the continual process of looking. Uh, one of the obvious ways that sexual lust produces itself in our world today, unfortunately, is through the media of pornography. There's been an interesting and, and is actual, I would say actually pretty predictable reaction to COVID and everyone being at home more than usual, everyone being on social media a little bit more than usual. As a result, pornography has, the viewing of pornography has risen. In fact, a couple of months ago, a giant uh, website for pornography uh, reported a 22% increase. That's, in, that's really an unbelievable stat. We have a lust problem in our culture that's found its way into the heart of God's people. Now, I want to give you some stats, and I want to be really compassionate as I do this. Because as we talk about the issue of lust, uh, it's something that I battle with. And so I, I don't want to separate myself from you and like, well, that's you, and then this is me as a pastor. This is something that... I have to deal with as well. But I, I want you to see the magnanimous problem that we have here. Here are some stats, and I tried to get as recent as I could, but these are even uh, older stats on pornography. It is a 13.3 billion revenue in the US. It is bigger than the NBA, NFL, the MBL all combined. Worldwide, it is over a $97 billion industry. 
Child pornography is a $3 billion industry annually. You know, pornography is a lot different than when I was growing up. You, you had to go and find it. You had to purposefully go after it. But now it's totally different. And, and it has gripped the hearts of so many people. And it's because of the three A's of pornography. It's affordability. It's accessibility. And it's anonymity. It, it, it's, you know, people don't know. It, it can be anonymous. You can have it right here on your phone. It, it's on your, uh, on your watch, on your phone, your whatever device you have. Another stat, 72% of pornography viewers are men. That's no surprise. Did you know the most popular viewing day is Sunday? Sadly, the increasing exposure of children to the internet porn is rising. Uh, age restrictions, you know, it's just a click. A kid can lie and say they're over 18 and they're given access to pornography. The age of exposure to pornography for children is lowering. It is lower every year. I saw one stat that said children as early as seven years old are being exposed accidentally many times to pornography. 93% of boys and 62% of girls first see porn before the age of 18. 25% of, of search engine requests are for pornography. 35% of downloads from the internet are pornographic. Uh, 40 million Americans say they regularly visit porn sites. Here's an alarming stat. The fastest growing rate of porn users are women. Over a third of our women are using porn these days. You see, the enemy has used this medium to enslave people, God's people. Many of you struggle with this, and I want to encourage you. This is not a sermon about pornography, but I couldn't overlook it because Jesus is talking about lust here. And so I want you, if you have a problem with pornography, to expose it to tell somebody of your struggle. I want you to expose the secret. Bring it into the light by sharing it with someone that can help you or that can hold you accountable. I know it's, you feel you're filled with shame. Trust me, I've experienced it myself. I have talked to my own children about this. I have talked to countless others about this. And I know shame is surrounding this issue. But I want you to know that shame grows in the soil of secrecy. And so you must uproot this by exposing it and it would help kill it. So I want you to know Jesus' words are very applicable to us today. And you may not have a problem with pornography. And I am that I wanted to say God bless you, but I, and I don't mean that in any sarcastic kind of way. I know that most many people do, but if you don't, thank the Lord, and just know this: we all struggle with lust in different ways. And so Jesus said, "You have heard that you should not commit adultery," and we would all say yes, amen to that. He says, but I say to you that everyone who looks, who continues to look, who fosters this look with a woman, or we can say with a man with lustful intent, has already committed adultery in his heart. This is an intentional, deliberate, not an accidental or unexpected look. I like what one, uh, and I don't remember where this quote is from. I had heard it was from uh, Charles Spurgeon, but I'm not really sure. But the quote is, you cannot control birds flying overhead, but you, cho you can choose to let them nest in your head. It's the same with lust. You, you, you can't control what comes by you or something that you just happen to see, but you can choose to let it rest and nest in your mind. This idea of a continuous look is not the first look. It's the second and the third, or maybe it's the first look that continues to look. It continues 
to give. You know, there is no sin in being tempted if it's resisted. Genesis chapter 39 <laughs> tells, I mean, it's a serious story, but it, it just shows you how less can enrapture people. That in the Old Testament, here was this lady who seemed to have everything, but she didn't have Joseph, a good-looking Hebrew young man. And in Genesis chapter 39, it says, After a while, this young man who was serving in her home, after a time, his master's wife, Mrs. Potiphar, cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. She was driven by what she saw. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant. Basically, he's saying, don't lust or covenant, covet after what someone else has. Lust is greater, obviously, than sexual lust. It's lusting anything that we don't have. We know the story of David of his lust issues in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. When all the kings were out fighting war, David had stayed home, and it says, it happened, that's a scary start to any passage, and it happened, one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of his king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. You guys know that story that he, from there, his lust drove him. When he saw, he continued to look. And then he acted upon what he saw and committed adultery and ultimately committed murder. In Job chapter 31, verse 1, uh, Job says, I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze at a virgin? It, it's, a, it's this sense that Job is warning us through his own convictions that we need to make a covenant with our eyes. This is the lust obviously begins in our heart, but it is connected to the eye gate and what we see. You see, James chapter 1 says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then his desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So we all struggle with this. We have it inside of us. It's brewing. This sin, uh, it, it tempts us. We see it or we hear it. We experience it. And then as we give into it, it births sin and death. But Jesus has a radical solution to this. Look at verse 29. Again, I want to say, who says this? Jesus does. So he's talking about lust. And he's saying you've already committed lust in your heart if you uh, have this continual look of lust. And then he goes on to say, if your right eye causes you to sin, and this is the word if you're baited by what you see, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out. Throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. What in the world is Jesus talking about? Is he, is he telling us to cut ourselves, to dismember ourselves? Is he saying that if you don't do this, you will go to hell? What is happening here? Jesus is speaking in extreme hyperbole. And, it, and you can think through this. You know this. He's saying this, deal with lust radically, with amputation. On the surface, I know it's startling, uh, to pluck out your eye, to cut off your hand. And honestly, there have been a few zealous Christians who have taken this literally and mutilated themselves. Monks, especially. Uh, you know, probably the best known monk that you would know of this is uh, of Alexandria, uh, origin of Alexandria. Uh, he went to the extremes, renouncing possessions and food and even sleep, 
And in an over-literal interpretation of this passage of Matthew, he actually made himself a eunuch. And that's the idea that he castrated himself. Uh, and of course, this became a, a, a forbidden practice among monks later. Jesus was speaking figuratively. Uh, otherwise, if he wasn't speaking in figures, we'd all be nubs. Just cutting ourselves. You know, we wouldn't exist. So what is he saying? He's saying, pluck it out, cut it off, cast it away. See, in, in Jewish culture, and I, I read this uh, from one commentary that I thought was genius. It said, in, in Jewish culture, the right eye and the right hand represented a person's best and most precious faculties. The right eye represented one's best vision. And the right hand, one best skill. Jesus' point is that we should be willing to give up whatever is necessary, even the most cherished things we possess, if doing that will help protect us from evil. Anything that morally or spiritually traps us, that causes us to fall into sin or to stay into sin, should be eliminated quickly and totally. And this, I mean, this is an... Unbelievable, but incredible thing to say, especially with the accessibility that, that we have with computers and all sorts of devices. And he's saying that a person, if it's a computer that is causing you to sin in some radical way, you need to cut it off. If it's a book, cut it off. If it's music, Cut it off. If it's a person, cut them off. This radical dealing with lust must start in the heart, though, before it's too late. Psalm 119, verse 37 says, Turn my eyes away from seeing worthless things or looking at worthless things. 2 Timothy 2.22, So flee youthful passions. And pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. He's saying, I want you to flee. I want you to follow. I want you to fellowship in a sense. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 18. Flee from sexual immorality. Everyone, uh, every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Again, church family, I, I just want to pause here and just talk a little bit. Jesus is saying this. I know that you uh, look at adultery and you might in your pride say, well, I have not done that. I have not committed adultery. And Jesus is saying, be careful. And he's talking to the Pharisees especially. He says, what will end up happening is because you think of that as self-righteousness, at the end of the passage, he says, you will end up in hell. He's not saying that those things will cause you to go to hell, but it's the fact that you're thinking that you're okay, that you're self-righteousness, that you can do it on your own as long as you aren't doing certain things, that your righteousness is enough. And Jesus is saying, no, that will end you a place in hell. He says, but if you find yourself having a problem with lust, cut off whatever it is that's, that's feeding it. Not physically, obviously, but he's saying, I want you to be so radical. I think that an answer Again, it would take another sermon because some of you are saying, well, Ray, what do I do about this? Let me leave you with three things. And you're going to have to do the work of applying this, okay? You're going to have to do the work of it, but at least let me give you some principles from 2 Timothy 2.22. When he says to flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. 
I believe this church family that if we practice these three things, it can move us from a life of lust to a life of holiness and joy and peace. The first thing he says, flee. It means to run. Get out of there. Quit being in the proximity of that which causes you to sin. Get away from it. Just because someone else might be able to handle it, just because someone else might be okay with it, you know you. And he's saying, when it comes to sin, when it comes to lust, when it comes to that temptation, run. But don't just run, because this is where we get it wrong. We run, but we're not running to something. So you not only run from something, but Paul is saying, I want you to run to something. What is that? He says, you begin to follow. That means to pursue, pursue righteousness. You see, don't just run from sin. Don't just run from temptation, but pursue righteousness. Go hard after it. Just like when you wake up, okay, I, I will admit something. If my heart is filled with lust, it's almost like I know that it's there and I try to feed it. I start thinking about it. And then I, how can I fulfill it? But see, when you're running from that and you're pursuing righteousness, you do just the same. You go, how can I feed this righteousness? How can I pursue this holiness? By what I read, by what I think about but what, what I listen to, by who I hang around. It says, not only flee, but you follow. Follow faith. Follow love. Follow peace. Devour the Word of God. Get in the Word of God. Read it. Saturate yourself with it. Listen to it. Sing it. Talk about it. Hear other people talk about it. Let it swim in your heart and your mind, everything, everywhere you go, every day. That's how you pursue. Don't just give it a touch. Don't just do it occasionally. Don't say you're pursuing something and you only do it once a month. That's not pursuing. You go after it. You know how you get obsessed with certain things. You know how you binge watch. You know how you talk about what you've binge watched. You know those things. Do the same thing when it comes to righteousness and holiness and peace. Read about it. Talk about it. Share it. So you flee. You follow you, that pursuit. And then number three, you fellowship. You go on. It says you follow faith, love, peace along with others who call upon the name of the Lord with a pure heart. You can't do it on your own. You can't run from lust on your own. You have to share it with someone. You have to talk with other people about it. As you are running away from sin, as you are pursuing righteousness and faith and, and peace, you don't do it alone. You do it with other people who are pursuing faith and righteousness and peace and faith. You do it along with other people. Quit isolating yourself. Now, I know during these days of COVID is hard, but make a way. Don't pull back. Share. I've got a couple of close friends that I can share with, that I can you know, sometimes when I get a phone call from one particular friend, I'm like, oh, no. I know we're going to get past all the niceties and find out what's going on in here. But I can tell you it's beautiful because I'm encouraged and hopefully he's encouraged at the end of it as well. And we come away from not embracing sin or lust, but we come away with more faith with more hope, with more righteousness. And it's because I've connected in community. That's exactly what you need to do, church family. Connect with others. And that's why we say become involved in a missional community. Get involved in a small group. Email Jake at, 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 you know, at the church and, and get connected. Make sure that you're not doing this on your own. Church family, I pray that you would not be discouraged at the end of that message, that you would find someone that you can talk to, that you can be accountable to. And know this, as you fight with the power of the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 6, 
in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. In one hand, you're fighting. But I want you to know, not by yourself. With the other, you're joining hands of someone else. And so, again, I don't want to leave you without hope. God will empower you through community. So as we look at Matthew chapter 5, don't try to do this on your own. You can do it together. God bless you, church family. I love you, and I can't wait to see you next week. The hour is dark And it's hard to see what you are doing here in the ruins and where this will lead oh but i know that down through the years i look on this moment and see your hand on it and know you were The waters you parted